Good afternoon and welcome to today's Educator Effectiveness webinar. We'll be addressing the topic of effective integration of technology and instruction during today's session. As was mentioned, I'm Elizabeth Greniger. I'll be facilitating today's event. And joining me is Michael Jay, the President of Educational Systemics, to share on our topic today. Before I do a formal introduction of Michael, I would like to find out who you all are and who's joining us today. <clears throat> In just a moment, you'll see a poll come up on your screen, and we'd like you to select the response that best fits the role you serve in. Great to see a lot of school-based folks with us. A good number of researchers and folks from higher ed. <coughs> I think you'll find that the content of today's webinar is applicable to you in any role you serve in. And we hope that you'll find something useful to take away to your own practice. All right, we'll get moving right along. <coughs> so as I mentioned, Michael Jay is today's featured presenter. Michael is a longtime educator. He's taught science in California, where he also worked in developing the first set of technology and the curriculum materials for the state of California. In 1986, he joined Apple Computer's Classroom of Tomorrow Research and Development Project and later served as Apple's Education Competitive Analyst and led major curriculum-related marketing initiatives for them. He remained a contributor to science education through many projects, including being one of the authors of California's groundbreaking science framework of 1990. Mr. J left Apple Computer to pursue the development of a technology of his own design that dynamically indicates the relationship between curriculum, curriculum standards, and instructional resources, for which he received patents in 1998. As a founder of MediaSeq Technologies, Incorporated, he laid the groundwork for many of the innovations of standards implementation and instructional resource integration that followed. He continued the development of tools for children and educators as the Director of Education Business Development at N2H2 and the Vice President and General Manager of Brainium Technologies in the following years, where he worked on the challenges associated with sustainable one-on-one -on -one computing in schools. He is currently the President of Educational Systemics. He's also served on the Board of the School's Interoperability Framework Association for 13 years playing a central role in the development of data specifications around teaching and learning. He served on the Software and Information Industry Association Education Board for 10 years, three as co-chair, and in his second year of co-chairing, the Association of Educational Publishers Content and Context Conference. As you can see and hear, he has a wealth of experience to bring to our webinar today. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Michael Jay. Great. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And I'll tell you, when I hear that, I, I, I feel ancient. And I hope I can make it through this two hours. So uh, I'll go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about what I'm going to discuss today. Um, we just talked generally about sort of the role of technology in education. Where does it fit? And also, as per some of your questions that I saw in advance, where does it not fit? Talk a little bit about educational technology the tech infrastructure, um, and then look at a case study um, around some research about the use of those technologies, and then talk a little bit about addressing the needs of all students, and then discuss some action steps. I, I do want to make sure that um, it's clear that although this is talking about effective integration of technology and instruction, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the actual use of software titles in the classroom. I think that um, a lot of people get that as part of their pre-service and in-service programs. Um, and, and increasingly, 
uh, the software and web-based uh, uh, resources are an integral part of and get used seamlessly uh, as part of integration in the classroom. It, it could be a whole other talk. What I do want to, what I am going to spend most of the time talking about is the nature of use of uh, technology to support understanding what the needs of students are, um, understanding what's available for to use with students for their particular needs, um, and understanding what the standards have to tell us about technology. And so I think um, for those of you who are more instructionally focused, I think you'll find it very, very interesting. And for those of you who are looking more at infrastructure related pieces, there's some real strong action items here um, for you as well. So I'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. <clears throat> so this is, uh, so again, we'll, we'll learn a little bit about what research says about effective ways to use technology. Um, I don't want to read all of these. We'll explore ways that educators can ensure they're preparing students to meet technological demands um, and uh, how that's integrated. And we'll talk about, you know, sharing strategies for keeping up with new technologies. And, and part of that is just understanding the kind of lifestyle you need to adopt as we look at this ever-changing uh, marketplace. So when we look at the role of technology, um, you know, technology is a word that gets bantered about quite a bit. And, uh, you know, we could look at certainly the dictionary definition, the, the science of application of knowledge to practical purposes. Um, and then the common usage, I think if you said somebody to somebody, hey, I'm using technology, I mean, they would inherently think computers, internet, all things that are electronic. Some people go as far as anything that you plug in. I mean, a blender, they would consider technology, and I guess... It is, although probably not all that useful um, in learning. Um, and then I, I like to use this more flexible definition that I find is, is works well, um, really looking at anything that extends our ability to perform tasks, perform new tasks, and approach tasks in new ways. And I think that's really the, the nature of, of, of what technology brings to education and instruction. And we'll talk a little bit about the three levels that I described there. Um, right away, I want to put right up front that going high tech does not mean that computers all the time. Um, and that goes back to uh, certainly my days when I was in the classroom. I mean, I taught in a classroom where I had one Apple II computer. Um, and there's some wonderful ways to use the technology. But just because you have it doesn't mean you have to use it all the time. There are certainly the right and potentially less uh, compelling ways to use that technology. And that was, uh, if you're ever interested, and I didn't even include this in the web links that I provided, if you go back to the literature that came out of Apple's uh, Classroom of Tomorrow project, um, I worked with David Dwyer and the whole group down there around that. And what we did is we gave uh, kids technology. We actually, at that time, gave them two computers and uh, one for home and one for school, because back in the mid-80s, they weren't as portable, and said, okay, when is the right time to use the technology, and when is it not the right time to be used the technology? Um, the tactile kinds of activities remain very, very important. Um, I'm a science educator by background, as you heard. Um, I still think that dissection is important because of the respect it brings for life, and also just the hands-on nature of, of, you know, organs and and even if it's just a, a a worm that you're dissecting i think there's an experience you get that you don't get with an online environment I, I would certainly hate to see us teach kids how to dribble a basketball online and not have them actually hold a basketball in their hand and try to make a shoot uh, with that so um i i think it's it's a careful balancing act and i i do want to stress that um there's certainly it's a controversial issue but i think that print meaning print on paper um, probably still very much has a place, um, even when we look at technology-rich environments. Um, first of all, a lot of schools still can't go one-to-one. -one. Um, there's huge equity issues there. But also, there's something about, particularly we see with younger kids and sitting down with books, um, there's, a, there's a tactile experience there that ends up being really quite important and, and useful. And there have been some interesting initiatives that have addressed that historically, an initiative I was involved with was with the NSTA and something called Silinks. Um, Silinks actually included web links embedded in the books that you could have dynamic references to uh, web-based assets. Um, and we've seen variations of that come out. That was that probably started somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 years ago. Um, and then a newer initiative actually from HP, which is really 
embedding a more transparent version of a QR code into books so that students can actually query the book um, and be able to get access to more information. And, and even beyond that, be able to create books they can share with one another, posters they can share with one another, and be able to then uh, associate data with that in a dynamic fashion and potentially have access to discussion. So I'm, th this conversation, at least from my perspective, is not that technology is, uh, is the panacea, is, is, is ultimately the best for all things. It's, it's a balanced approach. And we often hear the word multimedia. I like to prefer to use the term multiple media, um, which is really means the right media at the right time. And uh, I, uh, yeah. So I try to think there are there are variations on this, and I'm just showing you my variation on what I think of as sort of the three stages of educational technology. Um, and I alluded to this in one of my earlier statements. Um, the first is to accelerate. Um, and, you know, we often see that there's still a place for drill and practice. Um, and uh, I know that uh, um, uh, the Bells, um, who, 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 uh, who developed everyday math, for example, I mean, they're very much believe in, in students really engaging with and discovering content, but also recognizing that if you don't have some of that essential information at your fingertips or at the tip of your brain, whatever that might mean, um, uh, that you really can't, you don't have facility in working with that data and manipulating it. And so accelerating to get past that memorization level or getting past some of that initial piece still very much has its place. And although I'm not a proponent necessarily of drill and practice, or as they call it often, drill and kill, um, the, the repetitive nature um, that the technology brings to accelerate um, understanding around some of those basic facts is is compelling um, and allows you to get at some of the richer pieces um, of learning as well. And that's where we get into the ability of technology to help extend um, learning and building greater depth of understanding and more extensible knowledge. Now, again, I would say almost any project-based kind of learning or um, uh, uh, something where the student uh, is engaged at a deeper level and can take some ownership over their learning um, does a great job at extending the kind of virtual environments or simulations and other pieces that you can do with the technology are, are so much harder when you don't use the technology but i would want to do that in conjunction with um, you know if it's language arts reading of books but then doing so digitally and being able to make annotations hear somebody else's interpretation of that if it's a play being able to look at pieces of a play and see how an actor um, interpreted that. Um, in the case of uh, mathematics, the ability to be able to not just graph something, but be able to actually inquire about that graph and look at, uh, at really gaining the kind of literacy that we have expect around language arts really in mathematics. So that it's not just that you can define what a parabola is, for example, but really get an understanding about the nature and the dynamic of the equation that underlies um, a, a parabola. And that's where we begin to get it sort of transcending. And that is uh, really where the technology, I think, comes into its own, is the ability to provide access to learning experiences that are just otherwise unavailable. Um, sometimes that is through a process of distance learning. Um, I would love for kids to be able to travel the world, but it's a lot easier to do it from your classroom and talk to um, other learners uh, remotely and get their opinions about what's happening, for example, in a social studies classroom around world events um, or uh, often doing different kinds of data collection in science um, remotely or through some of the kinds of simulations um, that we've done. Years ago, there was a, a product that was put out by uh, Turk, um, which has then taken on some different forms, but it, uh, uh, it really allowed kids to manipulate data um, and be able to describe, give a, an explanation of how they're manipulating that data, show different representations of that data, and really engage in a discussion. And ultimately, it's, we're, our teaching is really about preparing kids for engaging beyond the, the, the more orchestrated view of what we call K-12 through education today. And if the technology helps facilitate that, and an educator playing a role of supporting that process, uh, uh, it's a very, very compelling ap approach to learning. Um, and, and 
you know, some people look at it as preparing for academic success, but it really has to do with um, 21st century skills and the ways that, that all students will be collaborating um, in the workplace, um, whether that's academic or, or hands-on kinds of work or uh, consulting or whatever they're doing. Those are the kinds of skills they need to build. Um, I'll also see something here about gratuitous use of technology. I, I think, um, I know when I've spoken to audiences about this, there's usually a big nodding of everybody's head. Because um, I, I, we've all seen it before. And, you know, it, it is, it's actually harmful. Um, I think that, uh, you know, gratuitous use of technology actually dilutes essential use. Um, we've all seen the digital whiteboard used to simply replace the chalkboard, but but not changing how it's being used. And I think what we do is we model for learners um, uses of technologies for rather, uh, I want to say mundane purposes, but certainly for purposes that don't require the technology and therefore um, the the capabilities of the technology are really undervalued. I'm going to skip to the third bullet there, which is this was one of the most egregious, and this maybe just offends me as a science educator. For those of you who are out there, you may be able to appreciate this, that there were students who were collecting data about refraction and reflection of, of light through substances. And um, uh, they, this was in a one-to-one -one program. I won't say where. Uh, and uh, they were collecting that data in, think about what application you would use to collect that data in. I'm sure you all have an answer. Well, I can tell you they were collecting the data in a word processor. Um, and it was utter frustration on my part. I asked the students why they were doing that. They said, well, that's what the teacher told us to do. I then spoke to the teacher, and she said, well, I probably should have used a spreadsheet, but I don't know how to use a spreadsheet. Um, and I worry about sort of kids understanding sort of the power of the technology to help them look at patterns in the kind of computations that can be done around the data that they're collecting and the misuse of the technology. We see the same thing happening where, you know, we, we have students taking online tests, but they're not getting feedback any quicker than we used to with, with paper tests. Part of the quick turnaround, again, is to, to provide students with more immediate feedback uh, so that they can then reflect on their learning, reflect on their understanding, and make those corrections dynamically. I know as educators, we often want to get it for our own purposes. Um, so that it can affect instruction. But ultimately, I think we need to get that into the hands of learners so that they understand where they're being successful and where they need to apply additional work. One of the newest examples of gratuitous use of the technology is 3D printing, um, where uh, classrooms where uh, hundreds upon hundreds of Tyrannosaurus Rex skulls get printed out one after another, um, which is nice, but quite honestly, probably could go down to the corner store and go buy a bunch of those. Um, and instead, really having an engineering, really a great STEM activity around trying to engineer something, do some design um, work. And then the 3D printer, I don't think of it as a reward. I think it is really creating the physical instantiation of the work and then the ability to test it and do other things of that sort. So. A lot of educators are not prepared um, for uh, managing uh, classroom activities in that fashion, and I think we need to be cautious about how we're using technology if we're not doing so in a thoughtful way. The, the bottom line is that uh, groups like uh, the, the Mid-Atlantic Lab uh, and these kinds of activities around professional development and creating professional learning communities are absolutely essential to see the good use of technology. And I know several of you asked that question in your survey in advance. And that's that just has to go hand in hand um, with the implementation, implementation of these technologies. And if, you, if you're in a school district where that's not done formally, I certainly have worked with school districts where um, teachers created their own special interest groups, um, where they got together and shared strategies that they'd read about or things that they've done and demoed them to one another. Um, you know, as professionals, I think we can also turn um, to ourselves. I know I certainly did that when I was in the classroom um, in terms of really trying to to look for ways to employ new 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 technologies, new strategies. 
So when we look at um, the standards, and we'll be spending a little time looking, a little bit of time looking at the Common Core um, standards and what they have to say about technology. Um, uh, I, I will say this: it's always a, I've, having served on on standards development groups. Technology is a really dangerous place to be. Um, for those of you who may have worked on these kinds of standards as well, which is you really risk. Uh, being having thrown back in your face five years later what you said and whether it still is relevant or not. So it's a you really have to reflect on it. But I think that the the group that put together um, both Common Core standards as well as NGSS have done a really nice job at really rising to the right level um, here. And and they for example at the highest level um, ex, you know state about using technology and digital media strategically and capably. Um, and really talking about use of models, collaboration, um, constructing artifacts, researching and, and using media. Um, and using doesn't mean just watching, but in fact creating um, media and then understanding perspectives and cultures. And I think you probably heard me touch on each of those in the examples that I just provided. Um, and I think that these will stand the test of time. So uh, for those of you who are, are take the philosophy of this too shall pass. Um, uh, I think certainly the standards will continue to be updated and changed, but I think these will really stand the test of time and are, are worth uh, really embracing. Um, looking at, uh, at the different levels that are described uh, within the standards, I really like the, the work that Fresno County Office of Education did back in 2012. Um, to compile some of these and pull some of these things out. And that reference is actually, that web link is included in the web links that are down there. They did just a, just a stellar job. So um, looking at, you know, the lowest level being just demonstrating proficiency in the use of, of computers. This is what we used to really call technology literacy. Um, uh, this is probably one of the hardest areas in that you'll find an incredible uh, uh, discrepancy um, broad differences between students depending on certainly related to socioeconomic level um, and uh, uh, related to their access to technology and also their experience around around use of technology um, it can also fool us as tech as as educators because the students will claim they know how to do everything um, and and yet they also work within some very very tight constraints about how they apply and use that technology and that's where uh, we as educators can play an important role in helping them extend their understanding um, and see how to uh, how to apply that uh, several years ago uh, my grandson came to live with us and he had a uh, uh, his bedroom right near where my office is and he would he of course he had a computer and he'd forever yell over to me how do I spell this? And I go, do you not have a dictionary on that computer? I mean, it's just amazing sometimes. My wife thinks that that was him just trying to connect with me. Um, I'd like to have higher value connection than that. And some of you may be able to relate to that. And, and you get that from students all the time. But these technology skills, uh, again, how to just turn on and off a computer, um, how to use things like spreadsheets. You can't assume, um, I, as I mentioned, even teachers about how to use spreadsheets, how to create graphs. Um, how to constrain that, understanding how to construct a database. Um, if you know how to do it, it seems pretty seamless, but we make a lot of assumptions about what students are capable of doing. Um, internet, networking, uh, being online, in, in a lot of cases, kids are pretty savvy about a lot of that. Um, in some cases, maybe a little bit too savvy, given their sort of stage of development. Um, but again, you'll find huge variation. Um, and, and again, I think in many cases, multimedia presentation tool, they'll often take a very linear approach where in fact, they really need to understand how flexible some of these tools are. And uh, again, some kids have their own websites and do a lot of web, web authoring. Um, in other cases, they just don't have that experience. They're consumers and not producers. So uh, important to help move them in that direction. The second level, um, uh, is really about just just you know demonstrating responsible use of technology, and almost every school has uh, has uh, has a set of rules and ethics that, uh, in fact, that often students have to sign, um, indicating uh, how they're going to use technology. I think part of it is making sure that uh, educators and that it's pervasive throughout the school that that we don't just say it, but we actually do it. There's a 
you know, uh, licenses around technology um, and, and really emphasizing that around uh, what they access online and how they access it will, again, hold them in good stead. Um, I think also being really mature about the fact that, you know, they'll, they'll encounter things online that they may not be comfortable with. Um, I, I'm... Uh, worked for a company that provided internet-based filtering for schools and did so, however, in a way that allowed people to be thoughtful consumers of that. I'm no more in favor of absolutely locking everything down um, uh, when kids need to have access to certain information than I am um, having the windows on school buses painted so kids can't see what's outside um, of the bus. I mean, I think you don't drive them through a bad neighborhood. But at the same time, they need to have the ability to see outside of um, outside and, and where they're driving. And uh, uh, the point is that if we don't give them the opportunity to encounter some of these things in a protected environment, um, they're going to do so on their own time in a way that they aren't able to grapple with them. And again, I'm not trying to say that they should have access to pornography and a whole myriad of other pieces. Um, uh, but in fact, uh, helping them negotiate uh, the wild world of the internet is still very, very useful. Um, and then on the digital literacy, looking at demonstrating the ability to use the technology for research, critical thinking, problem solving, all of these sort of more advanced processes. And, you know, how to create, for example, a decision table um, and how to rank things and how to... Uh, 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 collaborate with others around that. Uses of collaborative tools like uh, Google Docs, um, Google Sheet, and others around um, not just for gratuitous purposes, but again for real collaboration and understanding what it means to collaborate digitally um, is an important part of 21st century skills and the skills they're going to actually have um, and need to need to use. And um, yeah, I don't think I need to say much more there. If people have questions, certainly certainly pose those. So um, we have a poll and an open-ended question now. Am I turning this over to you, Elizabeth? Sure thing. Uh, that was a wonderful introduction to educational technology and a little bit about its place in the teaching and learning process. So now we want to open it up to some folks on the line to answer some questions and share your own experiences about this. Um, you'll see the two questions there. The first is going to be a multiple choice question. In which curricula or instructional areas does your school or district address these issues related to, to technology skills and knowledge? And we'll have a listing there of several content areas that you can select from. And the second part of the question, which will be up simultaneously, is asking you to respond in an open-ended format to the question, what instructional strategies are used to teach and hone these skills? So we'll put those two polls up and we'll give you a few minutes to respond and formulate your responses. While we're doing that, I'll just do a little bit of housekeeping. I know folks are wondering if today's event will be available after the webinar is finished. Um, that is absolutely true. It will be available to be posted on the Realm Atlantic website in about two weeks and you'll receive an email by attending today, indicating when that's ready. And we do encourage you to look at it again and share it with your colleagues. We also had a question about the professional development certificates. And you will receive one of those when you complete the evaluation at the end of today's webinar. So we encourage you to do that. And I think that's it for housekeeping. We encourage you to post your comments in the parking lot and um, any questions you might have, and we'll do our best to get to those throughout today's webinar. So moving us back over here, Michael, um, we're getting some responses to our multiple choice. Looks like yep. those are still coming in. Yeah. But it looks pretty well represented across content areas. I don't want to be the witnesses now. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really pleased to see that. I mean, there was certainly a time when people would have said that's relegated to the, the media center or um, is part of, uh, in, in many cases, science, where often you had somebody who was a little bit more, less techno, technophobic 
Um, but to see this kind of level of, of maturity is great, and it's not just being relegated to that and the tech classes and instruction. It really has to happen across the board, and the context is so essential. Um, and I'm looking at some of the, uh, the uh, open-ended responses here as well. Um, and uh, it just uh, one caught my eye around through multidisciplinary projects. And I think that technology particularly lends, it that, lends itself well that way, um, particularly if you can actually do some team teaching or coordinate projects across multiple, multiple courses. Um, the ability to, to work with a language arts teacher and a math teacher, groups that often don't work together. Um, I can coordinate, and I'm, I'm speaking, of course, in secondary single subject classroom. Um, as we all know, uh, ed elementary educators are much sharper in that area <laughs> and less, <laughs> less monolithic um, in how they approach that. So. These are great. Are we going to have access to these answers later, Elizabeth? We will. That's a great question. Uh, we'll have an archive of all of the poll question and responses, as well as the resources and questions that are shared in the parking lot. So those will be available when the archive of the event goes up. So um, don't feel like you have to track everything here and get everything written down, because we will have a record of that. So this is good. I think um, it's inspiring to see so, that there. Uh, uh, Elizabeth. Is... Oh. Go ahead, Michael. No. Um. Uh, are you are you going to end it, or can we leave it just running, or what? I don't know how that works best here. Yep. What I was going to say is that. Um, We'll move these off the screen in just a moment. Um, I was just making a comment that it's good to see the varied use of technology, and we're going to have some more opportunities for folks to share about their experiences as we move along. But I think it's a good time for us now to move into thinking about how the technology skills um, are present in the Common Core Standards, and I know you're going to talk to us a little bit about that. So I'm going to move these off the screen. And turn it back over to you, Michael. Perfect. And you advance the slide for me. How how generous. Um, uh, so uh, this is actually again taken from those Fresno County Office of Ed uh, documents, um, but they've really teased this out of um, the Common Core and. Uh, uh, I've already spoken about this sort of demonstrating proficiency, all those those areas that are the end. But I think it's also interesting to see how uh, those are 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 built over time. You know, as students um, get older, um, and I I expect this is actually the area that's going to that we're going to see some fundamental change in um, over time is as as students become more technically savvy um, as they are as the Good use of technology, or, or I don't know, so I say good use, but but um, you know, innovative and and really unique use of technology um, uh, becomes more common. I think that, uh, that some of these things that are reserved for older grade levels will migrate down. Um, so again, you can you can see within this. I'll just pull out a few things. I mean, I think there's not there are not many kids out there who don't know what icons are. And how those icons work, and I think this even reflects on the age of the the, the standards, even even over the short few years that it's been available. Um, I, again, don't assume, however, that knowledge. I think it's important for kids who just have not had normal access. Um, important for them to uh, have a chance now to play catch up um, as they get going. Uh, so, uh, and then as they get into upper elementary, um, really uh, getting into the actual, um, some of the common features across different applications and, um, you know, teaching them how to select a printer, I, I can just tell you, many of you probably are rolling your eyes right now, um, you know, it's, it's like, you, like teaching your, your child how to walk. I mean, you're looking forward to that time and then suddenly um, the world becomes so much more complex. So um, printing, 
um, has its own complications, and there are wonderful tools out there for controlling that. But be prepared, of course. Um, and then uh, uh, the ability to to really look at not just different features of operating systems, but giving them some experiences working across different operating systems can be important as well as they recognize that some of the same functionality exists, maybe just implemented somewhat differently. Um, and then we see that move up into uh, middle school and then, and then high school. And again, looking at becoming a little bit more complex over time um, as, as students get older. Uh, and uh, uh, again, being able to work a little bit more independently um, there should be far less instruction specifically about the technology and more around the application of the right tool, if that's a tech tool or if that's a hands-on piece. And in fact, hopefully over time, giving them responsibility for making the selection. Um, some of the work research that I had done um, with uh, Ann Brown and, and others at UC Berkeley um, really had to do with understanding um, uh, how do students select uh, the tools that they're going to use to perform certain tasks um, or conduct certain research and uh, uh, really understanding and we, we did see in terms of sort of pre and post as part of those studies that if you gave them time to explore and and discuss among themselves and provide guidance around which tools are the right tools and what the benefits are of those particular tools they begin to really think outside of, um, uh, they, they bring initially a pretty narrow view about what they use to do things. And I think they, they then expand that view um, when they have uh, those kinds of experiences. And again, the goal is that when we launch them um, into the quote unquote real world after 12th grade, they're hopefully um, have developed the schools where they can, they can really be uh, thoughtful consumers of technology and know when to use that and, and when not to use that. When we, when we look at some of the, the higher order kinds of tasks, and I'm, I'm skipping those middle area um, uh, tasks, uh, but when we look at uh, you know, demonstrating the ability to use technology to do all of these more, um, these more advanced tasks, uh, uh, again, I think that, uh, again, it's that process of giving them more and more ownership and the ability to drive that themselves. So, um, and I, I particularly like within uh, thir third through fifth grade under researching and gathering that point about number three listed there, if you can read that, if your eyes are better than mine, um, evaluate internet resources in terms of their usefulness for research. I think that, you know, uh, I, it's not inherently, people aren't inherently able to discriminate. And, and we see that for educators and even consumers as well, understanding sort of what it is that you really need um, sometimes the, the, the best tool is the right tool, not the most complex tool. And uh, I think that's particularly the case in technology. Um, you can find a tool that does everything for everybody, but in fact is so hard to use um, that it ends up not being the right one. So, um, you know, making sure that, uh, that students are, are making active decisions about which technology is going to employ and how they use that is, is a key component when we see them in upper elementary. Similarly, when it comes to, again, problem solving, um, a lot more guidance at the K through two level, although I think we often give more guidance than is actually required. I mean, these kids are pretty savvy. Give them a chance to make mistakes. Um, try not to do cookbook. Uh, and then uh, as you move up in grades, um, really, uh, uh, although still providing teacher direction, again, let them uh, select the technologies and play a more active role there. So if we look at, at, at uh, middle school and high school, um, we really are looking at, at creating uh, uh, communities of students that are able to um, collect and organize information. And again, using digital tools to do that um, and uh, using a variety of different kinds of computing devices. I, I gave a talk at an ISTE conference, actually it was NECC back then, um, which was called uh, uh, polygamous relationships between devices and students um, as my little rebellion against just simply one-to-one, -one, which is that I think we're going to see multiple devices. Certainly students encounter those in their lives. Um, there's no, nobody wants to carry that really big Swiss army knife around with them. Um, and in any case, they're going to be using lots and lots of different technologies. And um, having them begin to make those kinds of selections, there's something compelling about devices that collect data and are more specialized for that. Certainly in classrooms, they're more cost effective. Um, and then moving to devices that allow students to be able to 
um, use the output from those kinds of devices to then generate reports and um, and 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 again more use of multiple media as part of that explanation process. So. Um, uh, and you know, and again, in ninth through twelfth grade, looking at selecting the right search engines, I think the tendency is you default, um, as I think we all do, to the one search engine that we most use. Um, but I think understanding the differences between them, and also the subtleties about how to search, um, uh, amazing how many people don't understand, um, uh, you know, the use of quote marks um, and some of the you know use of a negative and be able to refine that. When I was at N2H2. We actually were able to see how students searched, and it it was I want to say funny. It was kind of sad funny uh, when you saw kids just scrambling to try to refine those searches, but simply changing the order of words or finding synonyms um, and not really restructuring the nature of their search. I think they they uh, they desperately want to improve that, but we can really help them um, with that process as well. So embedded within the Common Core, I mean. Uh, if somebody ever says, oh, we don't have time to teach those tech skills, um, uh, you can say to them, well, is Common Core important to us? If it is, those tech skills are there, I promise you. Um, and uh, uh, I think you'll find those uh, threaded throughout um, uh, a lot of instructional materials, particularly those as they're beginning to accommodate Common Core um, that much better. So uh, again, what do these all have in common? There's really an emphasis on process here. Um, asking, you know, informed questions, that's more powerful questions, um, and uh, gathering information, synthesizing that, and then hopefully developing knowledge that you're then going to apply someplace else. Um, so uh, this technology really adds a very, very dimen different dimension than we've seen in some earlier frameworks and standards um, because of the capabilities it provides. There of course are um, uh, not just the Common Core. Um, uh, there are uh, the, the uh, next-gen science standards um, that uh, look at, uh, at uh, domain-specific knowledge and skills um, in addition to um, the uh, uh, in addition to our, our math standards um, and also the, the National Science Education technology standards, the NETs. Uh, for those of you who are steeped in technology, I'm sure you're probably pretty well steeped in those. Um, but important to recognize that those are not just standards for students, um, but they also consist of standards for teachers and, and that's right, administrators too. Um, and if it's done right, um, you really have created a culture for use of technology um, and, and understanding around that. So. Um, you know, technology, particularly because of the, in some cases, uh, fiscal implications and and uh, planning and reporting and other processes, administrators really do get very, very much involved. And I think having an administrator who is enlightened about the role of technology and uh, is in sync with um, instructional strategies uh, and the teachers who know how to facilitate and work with students as part of that process. Um, I think that uh, the NETs do a very nice job in helping coordinate those, and I highly recommend that if you're not already um, using those tools. So here's our next question. Over to you, Elizabeth. Sure. Well, before I get to this question, what you were just talking about on the previous slide with respect to the standards guiding both the instruction of students but also the learning of educators, uh, teachers, and administrators. We did have one question from a participant that I think is pretty relevant. Um, this person asked, what are the best strategies for integrating technology in the classroom when instructors vary in their technological expertise and confidence? So we see this with educators at all levels that just feel like they might be lacking in the skills to instruct students. Could you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, uh, there, there, uh, there's a whole spectrum, of course, of, of educators who, in terms of how they use technology and on, on a variety of other topics as well, but particularly around technology, um, you know, it's, it's not unlike um, trying out a new teaching strategy, for example. You, you probably want to start that individual with something that's a little bit more scripted, 
um, that is a little bit more less, you know, sort of open-ended and a little bit more uh, directed. Um, we've certainly found that very useful. When I was at Apple, um, I took the money that I had for creating marketing materials and created instructional resources with it. You know, there's the teacher in me. Um, but creating units that actually modeled not just how to integrate the technology and, and reference particular software titles at that time, now it would be web-based assets, and um, but also, you know, the kinds of questioning and modeling some of that for the teacher. And again, you know, uh, when you step out of your comfort zone, I think having something that is well-documented that you can model. Now, if, if you don't have access to those kinds of lessons. The other thing is to, to really team up with a teacher who already knows how, and, you know, has already shown and, and has, uh, you know, is comfortable using the technology and uh, have the teacher observe a lesson, um, have them maybe document it for others. I think that often works well is to document the technology intensive lesson and then have them try it with their students. And if that, if another teacher can be there to observe, that's great. If not, you can certainly record it. Um, and even if that doesn't happen, I would say immediately sit down and, you know, sort of write down what your reservations were, where you think you were strong in others, and then sit down with a colleague and, and really discuss that. So I think there are, um, there are strategies. Uh, I, again, try to do something that's not too technically difficult. Um, where the technology might fail and you'd find yourself stumbling. Um, uh, you know, as you get good with it, you, you eventually learn to just roll past it. So, uh, but not for an early adopter. Great, that's really helpful. I know that's probably a question on many folks' minds. Um, <clears throat> so let's turn to the question that we have here on the screen. We are curious to find out how you all think technology can support the implementation of new standards at your school. So we're aware that not every state is working with Common Core, but most states are working with a new set of standards in one content area or another. And um, if you are working particularly with the NET standards that Michael was talking about, we're interested in hearing about that. So we're going to open up this poll and um, Talk to us a little bit with some comments and examples about how technology is supporting your implementation of the new standard. And while we do that and folks get some thoughts out there, we had two questions that came in in the parking lot, Michael. Um, I'm just going to restate those in case you missed them. Um, one person asked, mm -hmm. what will attract tech people to education to teach educators? So <clears throat> this notion that if we get more people who understand technology and understand its value and um, the contributions it can make to our teaching and learning processes, that it, it could help educators who might not be so familiar. So kind of building off of that last question and the comments you made there, what, what can we yeah. do to attract yeah. technology people into education? Yeah. Um I so let me let me sort of go at the very at the very essence of that question. I I I have seen it's it, just because somebody sorry taking a different tack here. Just because somebody is technology savvy and lives and breathes technology doesn't mean that they'll do a good job transferring that um, understanding or engaging somebody. I think that. Um, I mean, we are all familiar with that old adage that you know a person with a hammer sees everything as a nail. Um, and I think that uh, where I've seen really the greatest success is where we've seen educators who have been early adopters of technology um, then working with other educators to help them understand the strategies. Because although the technology certainly is an important part of it, it it's, it's incredibly uh, it, it, minuscule compared to the understanding about how do you manage a classroom we're using technology and 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 uh, the interaction between educator and students, students and students, um, and how that actually takes place, and and students and and the technology and using the technology to help mediate conversation and the ability to step back. So um, I I don't think it's about attracting necessarily more technologists into education. I think it's identifying those who have um, adopted technology into their teaching and then having them uh, available to others to help transfer that kind of 
what they've learned. They'll be certainly far more empathetic, I can tell you that. Great. I had a hunch that that was going to be part of your response. So um, I, I can understand <laughs> that, you know, the educators and make them technology savvy versus bringing the technologists in to become educators. Uh, so lots of comments coming in here. Let's take a look at what folks are saying. Um, Yeah, I'm looking through this. Um. One that's jumping out at me is Leslie's comment about yeah, using I mean, technology. A, a nice mention here, and I'll talk about that. Sorry, I think we have a little delay. So go ahead, Michael. That's, that's exactly the one that I'm looking at. That's exactly the one that I'm looking at right now. Leslie's note about... Um, about supporting it with students with disabilities. And I, I want to sort of riff off of that and say um, uh, clearly, I mean, I think that's a, that, that is absolutely clear, that students that have particularly physical disabilities, um, the technology can play an important role, as well as looking at cognitive disabilities. But I, I think a, a phrase that I coined in response to No Child Left Behind was every child helped ahead. And that's recognizing that um, every child as an individual has areas where they are strong and areas where they're weak. Um, and the technology can really play an important role in helping support them, both in the areas where they're weak and where they can excel. Um, and I think that's uh, just a, an important piece of how one integrates technology. If you simply used it the way you've used it in the past, um, any kind of learning material, you won't get the benefit. But if you allow learners to take greater ownership over their learning, and give them access to that information and learn how to sort of manage that. I think, uh, again, students with any capability will, will uh, we've seen this, that, that uh, they can move ahead. Again, I think that they're, uh, I'll just keep going here for a sec. Students who have learned how to play school, where they're looking for, tell me what to do next, um, that becomes a really a difficulty when you try to give them greater ownership over their learning. Um, and again, uh, uh, it really allows us to engage students with disabilities of all different sorts as in, into core activities and uh, make sure that they're involved. Um, I love a lot of these comments that are here. These are great. Um, and I think this, you know, the, 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 the stimulating and preparing and engaging students is, is key, but I think that the novelty of the technology um, that we saw, you know, early in the implementation certainly wears off. I think they're happy to be, to have a computer in front of them. Um, I think that if you don't, again, hand them some ownership over that, um, they're used to being autonomous learners when it comes to using the technology, and you want to really build on that and not, not quell that, uh, that, that sort of uh, tendency. These are great. Michael, if, I don't know if you've gotten down to Sarah's comment. Um, this one's interesting and grabbed my attention. She's talking about a product that they're using in their state to support PLCs, online PLCs, and use of teacher instructional videos with the focus on technology yeah. standards, uh, teaching the standards, but technology integration. Um, that seems like a wonderful initiative uh, although she does say teachers' involvement has been slow and districts are working on ways to provide time, 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 you know, the big problem um, for educators to participate and engage in this learning. Do you see initiatives like that happening throughout the country? Um, is this somewhere that we're going to see more of a focus? I, you know, it's, um, and it's not new. I mean, that's the, um, uh, I, uh, many, 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 many years ago, um, I did some work with Mary Bud Rowe down in Florida, uh, where we actually did record um, educators who were teaching, in this case, science lessons using technology, um, and we put them on, on that's right, laser discs. Um, but but um, it, it, it is a, a tried and true, you know, uh, effective form if you provide enough guidance to educators to help them 
not just watch, but help point out those areas where um, where they're really making effective use of the technology. So um, I think with uh, some of the low cost uh, video recording capabilities and some of the tools that help um, use those technologies, I think we will see more of that. Again, I think it gets back to an earlier question or a question that I think we had looked at earlier, Elizabeth, around sort of use of time. Um, and I think that we undervalue the time, the, the, the huge impact that educators taking time to learn how to teach better um, has on, on learning for, for students. I think we, we micromanage students and we don't give teachers enough time um, to, uh, to work collaboratively around these kinds of pieces. So I, I think we are going to see much more of that. Um, but it takes, again, an enlightened administrator to understand the importance of it. Great. Well, we could continue the conversation on these examples for another hour, but we have a lot more to get to. So I want to move you along to the next section. I know you're going to talk a bit about infrastructure next. Absolutely. Um, so I'll go ahead. Uh, this is really, um, uh, again, this, this talk could have gone any number of different directions, but I really uh, wanted to address this topic around just the, the infrastructure related to uh, technology and how that infrastructure plays an important role. Um, I love this diagram. So, um, and I, I certainly want to make sure you all have access to it because I think it's a great way to think about, um, about the role that technology plays in these various processes. And I want to thank uh, Jill Abbott, um, who was at the department in Ohio and uh, then went on to work with the Schools Interoperability Framework Association. Um, and this is an adaptation of, of, her, uh, of her slide. Um, but, uh, you know, really carving the world into sort of a planning learning, capacity building, and then looking at kind of the outcomes and results, and then the feedback loop that goes into all of that. Um, technology can play a role in, in every one of these areas and can play an incredibly important role in helping facilitate particularly those arrows that you see there. I think there's a tendency to silo um, the kind of information that we get. And um, looking at the ways that technology can help facilitate communication across these different barriers is key. I mean, how many times, I I can admit it now, it was 20 plus years ago, but, you know, the school district made me turn in a set of lesson plans at the beginning of the year for what I was going to teach. And, you know, I, I'm listening to what the students learn. I'm learning, listening to what they're interested in. Um, if there was a way to do that far more dynamically back then, I think it would have been far more useful both to the district and to me into the collaboration. And we do see tools that allow us to do a lot of that today and, and really uh, support flexibility between some of these pieces. But again, being able to turn around some of these, um, these data uh, more quickly, um, to understand the context of the information that's being collected, um, and the ability to apply that uh, information, uh, uh, I think that's, that's really the new frontier, by the way, is, um, is understanding what are the implications of what we see and how does that affect and uh, how should it affect uh, uh, the, the learning environment, the instruction, and other things. So we'll be talking um, for most of the rest of this talk about, about these different components um, and where they fit and, and the role that technology plays. And the tendency sometimes is to relegate this to an administrator to really handle all of that. But um, uh, if you're a classroom teacher or, or somebody who's a curriculum area specialist, you really need to be well versed um, in this because it's essential to how um, the nature of, of your role is changing um, and having access to the right information at the right time to be able to make informed decisions. So, um, I'll start with a topic that many of us are familiar with, which is learning management systems, LMS. Um, and that uh, I, I would say that learning management as a whole is not about technology. Um, and uh, I'll also say that uh, there are many organizations that call themselves, there are many products um, that are called LMSs, um, and it doesn't mean the same thing to everybody. And that's particularly problematic. So uh, 
I've seen RFPs come out from school districts asking for an LMS, and if you compare across uh, multiple, they have certainly have different expectations. But in the end, it's really about pedagogy and instructional philosophy. I mean, who who are we serving through the LMS? Is it the institution or the individual? I think um, uh, the institution should come second and the individual should come first. And I think that's important as you're looking at the kinds of learning environments that you're providing is, um, how do, I, how do I provide the best technology for the student um, so that it helps support their learning? And then thinking about how do I then extract from that uh, data about um, the nature of their learning and, and really think about it as communicating ahead um, to the next educator who will be working with them, the nature of who that learner is. Um, and, and that they're really not mutually exclusive, but I think we need to, again, put the individual before the institution. Um, it's the way we've gotten to where we are is that this concern about sort of the Wild West and the implementation of technology and a, and a general feeling, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I think it's a, a Western culture sort of thing, that if we can just tighten down control, everything will be better. Um, that's again not the case, and I'll, I'll say once again as I did earlier, again, the more we can engage the learner as an active participant rather than doing education to them but doing education with them, the technology can really help facilitate a lot of that and, and, and really um, allow them to uh, tweak the learning that's taking place and how they work with it. So again, I think we're seeing evolution of the learning management system, particularly as we're seeing increasingly um, adaptive systems, but again, I think so often the learner is left out of that process. So, um, uh, the, the, you know, just like uh, my doctor would love me to lose weight, but they can't do it for me. <laughs> Ultimately, I need to understand um, what's going on with me, and I think the same thing is for learners. Is uh, uh, you know, the responsibility needs to be shared, um, even as even as we discuss issues around accountability and the like. So um, here's that LMS gate name game. Um, all of these things are listed under the, the term LMS in some cases. Course management system, digital learning environment. Uh, E-portfolio is often a large part of an LMS and, and often get included in that fashion. Um, when web content aggregators often wrap their materials in that. So um, it's important to know what it is that you're looking for when you're talking about managing learning through some sort of digital environment and, and knowing sort of the right code words um, to use as you're doing that. Um, I think that this really boils down the most essential, and this comes from Harrison Hoffer um, from 2009, and that is really looking at these spectra um, that describe learning management systems. So looking at more teacher-centered versus more student-centered, um, I have my own biases, by the way, but uh, again, I think even just being explicit and thinking about where the systems that you're working with fall, um, uh, even if it's within an integrated system provided by a single publisher um, or a more open system like Moodle and how you're implementing it, thinking about these different spectra is important. Looking at, uh, at a, a particular kind of learner, convergent, divergent, it could be any type of learning and think about the spectrum and how you can support potentially students, learners across that spectrum. Um, whether they bring, you know, a lot of prior experience or whether um, uh, it, it provides kind of more of those experience integrated. Um, I mean, you can read through all of these in terms of uh, the kind of the nature and, and, and pedagogical approaches um, that are taken. But uh, don't just, you know, the tendency is to say, I, I'm using an LMS. Think about the nature of the LMS that you're using and what it actually provides. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, whether you can add additional resources to address the needs of particular learners or whether it's a sort of an all-in-one solution. Um, when we look at, at the LMS marketplace, um, while there's relatively low implementation, I, I think it's actually grown considerably. Um, you know, about 40% of the districts report uh, full implementation. That means district-wide. Um, and I think that's, that's pretty impressive. Um, uh, but we still see that a lot of school districts uh, still do not have a complete uh, LMS implementation of some sort. And in fact, one of the biggest drawbacks is that many districts are using a lot of different LMSs. 
Um, and uh, uh, while that's good, finding the right tool at the right time is great. I think having some kind of centralized way to to manage some of that and support the educator. I would hate for educators to have to become um, system operators around all of these pieces. I think that um, again, some of these environments are maturing, uh, but uh, you know, focus on the student, not the technology. So, 62% uh, of the districts use more than one LMS. And I know that um, that that's remained reasonably stable, and that there's again a lot of confusion, um, and some. Organizations don't even know what an LMS clearly is. I would not call Rosetta Stone an LMS, even though it's a single application with a whole variety of lessons. Um, uh, one could argue that. And if, if you want to argue it, let me know. Happy to do it. <laughs> um, I think we're at a pivotal point, however. Um, you know, a lot of, more than half the school districts are using an LMS. Um, there are a lot of small providers out there that serve a small number of districts. Um, and I think again, they're often filling, fulfilling a particular need. Um, and yet 18% of the districts, you know, reported that they do not use an LMS at all. Um, and that to me is hard to imagine. Um, and again, that could be a, a, a definition issue. But um, we see a lot of school districts that are looking to purchase an LMS in the next few years. And uh, I think it's important that educators be informed um, about the nature of LMSs and play an active role in helping with that selection process. And quite honestly, if you've created an open environment where students can be involved, let them participate as well. I mean, I think you'll always gain some great insights from students about what it is that they're looking for and what works best for them. Um, do be cautious, although, of students who have learned to play school um, <laughs> because they'll simply report back what, what, their what they think the expectations are and give them an opportunity to really present a vision about where and how that technology can be employed. So let's look at, at really four trends around uh, learning management systems. One is um, looking at sort of this disaggregation and openness, really looking at, um, at LMSs moving away from being simply a, a suite of products all pulled together, you know, content products. Um, all pulled together under one management environment, but increasingly looking at um, more open systems where uh, they certainly may include some content, but uh, are increasingly allow you to be able to integrate content from other providers, but also be able to integrate teacher-created content um, and the ability to be able to, uh, to manage that under the same system. I think that's key as we look at creating a uh, differentiated uh, learning experience and again addressing the needs of all students um, with all capabilities and uh, uh, again there's a there's a tendency to think that if I just buy a system that is uh, that is sealed and comes with everything that first of all um, uh, just because it's put together in that fashion that uh, I no longer have responsibility or culpability for the effectiveness of that and uh, and also the, the general belief that uh, you can just buy a solution that will solve all problems. I think for those of us who have been in education for a significant period of time, we know that the educator's role really is, is most apparent when it comes to addressing the needs of students who are outliers and the ability to be able to, uh, be able to accommodate them and be able to use it. And having an open system certainly allows that. The second trend really looking at uh, environments that are integrated with classroom instruction. For those of you who are old enough or live in a uh, school with a time warp, um, uh, we all know about the computer lab um, where in the worst case, the teacher sends students bound down to a lab where they do something um, that is totally disconnected with classroom instruction. Um, I think, uh, and I'd love to hear from all of you, I think that that model is significantly waning. Um, I don't think we see nearly as much of that happening as we did at one time. And in fact, the educator playing an active role in integrating that into their learning experiences. And so we do see um, some pushback um, in that process. And we see um, other kinds of learning devices being integrated into it. So that it becomes, the, it becomes not about pullout, but rather an integration and the use of the technology as a part of instruction. Um, and the learning experiences students are working with. And, and increasingly, as we see students not just uh, 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 consuming information, 
um, but also looking at this learning environment as a way to be able to have students share, create and share um, the kinds of things that they're creating really turns this on its head. Um, our third trend, and this one's a little bit dense, I apologize for that, is really looking at uh, at uh, technical standards and um, use of some common technical standards around this. Again, you know, some of you who are on this uh, on this webinar need not know a lot of the details, but recognize that uh, there are some advantages to having some standards about how data is being shared, how products are integrated into a learning environment. And those standards exist out there, and you need to be aware of that as you're selecting product. Um, and uh, and uh, being smart about it is is absolutely key. There are a number of organizations that create standards. There's actually one that's important that's missing off of this, and I apologize for that, and that is the Common Education Data Standards Group. They are have actually pulled together a number of these players um, and have created a common data model, a common set of underlying data, and and uh, and uh, defined the relationship between these different data pieces. And what that means is that once you make a selection um, of a product, you know that it will uh, share data, uh, or at least conceptually will share data. Techn technically, that's that's another story. Um, but uh, recognize it's not. Uh, you should be looking at the standards and thinking about how you want to collect data about student progress. Uh, again, this does not take the place of an informed educator who's observing a student who's actually working, but trying to create uh, some some trail of data that you can then go back and look at, and and especially as students get older, have go back with the student um, to look at some of that information. It also allows you to be able to combine that with other kinds of administrative data and ask some really powerful questions. I think one of the most compelling examples um, I heard from a superintendent was they saw that there was a group of students who were not doing particularly well in some of their classes. They looked for some common data, and it turns out the data they needed was actually in the transportation system. So they took assessment data and transportation system data and found that a majority of these students were sitting on uh, an hour-plus bus ride every morning, were having to get up a lot earlier, um, were exhausted in a lot of cases, and were able to address some of that. But you can't ask those questions unless that data is in a in kind of a centralized place where you can uh, where you can have access to that. Having these systems talk to one another is absolutely essential. And the last one is really looking at uh, learning environments that are coupled to accountability um, by federal agencies. And I, I think the probably the most important impact of this is that if it's done right, um, uh, the kind of data you have to report is a natural outcome from good instruction. And uh, you don't have to spend a lot of time digesting and redigesting that data. Now, that doesn't happen necessarily right out the gate. I think there's a social process and an implementation process that ha has to happen. But it really allows uh, a school, an educator, a school, a district, to really focus more on student learning and less time on, on how to report all of that kind of data. And uh, we see a lot of good trends around that and, and what's called vertical reporting of that kind of information. So I've, I've mentioned, and I, I apologize in advance, this is pretty dense stuff. I'm listening to myself um, as, as I've been taught from, from my days back in, in a school of education. So. Um, I know there's a lot to digest. Um, uh, I will talk about, you know, there's this term interoperability that people tend to stumble over, um, but it's really the ability to be able to share information. And there are two kinds of real key type, types of interoperability that you should be looking at when you're looking at systems that you're looking at to support instruction. One is the data interoperability. That's the one I've been talking about so far, the ability to exchange and aggregate data um, from a variety of different sources. That means that you could assess one way in one class and assess another way and then find ways to be able to combine that data uh, or at least integrate that data in a way that you can look at a, at a consolidated uh, grade book or a consolidated record for a student um, and attendance systems and other kinds of pieces to really produce a whole picture of that learner. The other kind of interoperability has to do with content. And um, it used to be back in the in uh, back when I was younger that you purchased a piece of software and the software was content everything all in one 
And uh, increasingly, I think you're going to see a move away from some of that, particularly when you look at the kind of rich environments that ebook readers are providing, um, uh, which, although different from an LMS, I'm sure somebody soon is going to call their ebook or an LMS. Um, but uh, when we look at some of the emerging technologies like uh, EPUB 3, um, HTML5, for those of you who are more uh, propeller heads, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, the, what we traditionally call an ebook and what you think of typically on your, on your Kindle um, is really changing. Um, the ability to be able to interact with content, the ability to share things socially, the ability to be able to annotate, um, I think those are becoming more and more important. And the question is, um, how, does, how do you move the content that you need to have access to or that you want your students to have access to into the right kind of ebook reader that you're going to be working with? And so there are emerging standards that have to do with the ability to be able to migrate that content, the content living, in many cases, independent from the actual ebook reader. There are organizations that sell an integrated solution, but I think we're seeing a movement um, towards, uh, uh, again, the ability to be able to integrate it into your ebook reader of choice. And a lot of the functionality to address students with special needs and um, uh, students that are bilingual and others are not, are not just part of the content, but are in fact part of the, the environment that um, the student uses to read that content. In many cases, what we would refer to as an ebook reader. Um, what I don't address here is that that term is ambiguous. Um, we think about a, a, a hardware device as a reader, but also there are different software um, types that are used as readers. So, um, uh, you know, it's important to, to be aware of that and think about those issues as you're, as you're looking to use content, whether it's, you know, something you've purchased or something that's open. Um, it's only open as much as you can gain access to it and, and need to really look at um, how students are going to be using that content. So interoperability is an important term to really think about and, and recognize both of these kinds of interoperability. Um, uh, the ability of content sources, uh, uh, again, to be able to share it, I talked about some of this. Um, I think that also content repository is an important part of that solution. So um, that means having a central place where you find content, but also having the right kinds of metadata, um, the descriptive information around around that content, so that you know having something out there but unable to find it is not sufficient. And uh, there's a project, uh, I don't think I included a link to it, but I can certainly do so, and that's called the Learning Registry, um, which is a project of the U.S. Department of Ed, and I think it's also Department of Defense, um, uh, in terms of uh, creating a uh, a card catalog without the cards, um, a digital catalog of instructional resources. And there are a number of, of uh, environments that are actually using that at the state level, um, and even some publishers that are using that to make materials evident. Um, and uh, uh, you, you'll see that. Sorry, I was just glancing over at people's questions. Um, at, uh, as part of the, that uh, learning re reading registry project. So. Um, others are pursuing that kind of learning registry as well and the kinds of metadata that might be used. Um, you probably should be familiar with something called the LRMI, which is the Learning Resource Metadata Initiative. Um, and that is an effort that's being uh, conducted, uh, was originally being done by Creative Commons and uh, also, also the Association of American Publishers. It now is under uh, is under the g governance of a group called the uh, uh, Dublin Core, um, but I think you'll you'll begin to see some of these LRMI elements um, in some of the kinds of searches that you're going to be doing. And again, the focus there is on the instructional application, not necessarily on who is the publisher and how many pages does it have. Acting on patterns is essential. And I think this takes us back, interestingly enough, we're talking here about educators and administrators acting on patterns, but it really does take us back to um, the Common Core Standards, which do exactly the same thing, is, is asking us to collect information, um, doing so thoughtfully, and being able to, to make sense out of that information. So, uh, and, and the same thing holds true when it comes to these kinds of um, these, these kinds of data that we're collecting is being able to turn that into actionable pieces. And so we're, we're clearly looking at ways that we can make that kind of 
information available to all of those who are involved in instruction, and that's students, teachers, administrators, and parents. And I, and I don't want to leave off those who are creating instructional resources. There's been certainly a lot of controversy, and I did see a question go past about FERPA and uh, access to data. Um, I think it's a it's a, a careful balancing act, and and yet providing um, those who are creating instructional resources with information about how those resources are being used and how effective they are is an important piece of feedback to producing good quality materials. Um, doing so in a way that is uh, anonymous and uh, uh, is absolutely understandable, and I think that the SIIA Software and Information Industry Association did a nice job to uh, to create essentially what's called the privacy pledge. Um, uh, but uh, again, you know, think about how who has access to the data, how they have access to that data, and the strength and implications that having access to those kinds of data are have for improving the use of and development of instructional resources. We talked a little bit about content repositories, sort of centralized places. Think of a repository as your hard drive would be a repository. It's a place where you keep those things that are near and dear to you. <laughs> and you go back and reuse them over and over again. Um, increasingly, we look, think about these, what are called registries, which is what the learning registry is which is just data about resources and not the actual resource itself. There's also, um, and this is typically at a school district or at a state level, something we call data warehouses, which is a place to be able to store data, but in a, in a thoughtful way so that you can then generate those kinds of queries that we were discussing to understand you know, what kind of administrative, administrative decisions can be made to inform those kinds of decisions, um, and uh, and hopefully lead to smarter selection of content, um, which you can then find through the metadata. So all these pieces really work well together. I think the dark side of this often, depending on who you are, is when it's used for commercial purposes. Um, although, quite honestly, I would much rather see a commercial come up to me about something I'm interested in than, uh, than get some of these obscure... Um, uh, commercials that I'm unaware of. Imagine if the commercial instead was saying, hey, I see that you're looking at this particular instructional resource. Have you thought about this one? And that's particularly useful if that comes from your district, where in fact they've, they've already purchased it or they have that in a repository where you can gain access to it. So um, uh, turn the smile up on the dark side of how we use these technologies. Um, and uh, it's really important to bring together those who have a need and those uh, and the information about where they can find those kinds of answers. And that could be data, it could be content, um, and yet all of it requires some sort of metadata to have the hooks that allow us to get access to that. And I, I've previously mentioned the learning resource metadata uh, 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 work, and the LRMI um, initiative uh, is actually metadata having to do with instruction. The CEDS, the Common Education Data Standards that I referred to earlier, um, it really contains a lot of the other kinds of administrative and instructional kinds of data. So I've, I've worked with many districts where I've seen them try to recreate this from scratch. Um, don't do that. <laughs> you may want to add a, uh, adapt uh, something, but definitely make sure that you're aware of kind of the data standards that are out there. Um, and and the, it's not just about not doing the additional work. It also allows you to link to um, how others are actually working. Um, I won't dwell on this about the, the benefits of interoperability, but I think it's an important piece that um, we all benefit from that interoperability, whether it's around personalization or having uh, uh, better data analysis for teachers um, or administrators in terms of, I mean, absolutely key, re you know, reducing redundancy and errors. It's amazing how fast technology can um, take an error and it gets reproduced every place. We all know that from Facebook and other places. Somebody just needs to post something once and suddenly it becomes true for everybody else. And that can just wreak havoc on systems. And so having data exist in one place and then uh, simply replicate it as it's needed so that uh, one system actually owns that. And then ID to IT departments, again, really allowing them to focus a little bit more on supporting instructional applications and less time spent on sort of system and infrastructure. Um, can't say enough about how important 
um, that is to inform. And it, and again, it's all about technology. It's it's all about how we make good use about the underlying technology. When it comes to thinking about instruction, however, if you follow that model A there, this has sort of been the traditional way that that educators and teachers and others get access to content. The content developer creates it, publishes it, sells it to a school district, and then it gets distributed out to each one of those individuals. Um, what we see is we're, we're in the process of moving through this transitional model of the content developer creating it. It then goes into some sort of digital learning environment. And again, I'm using that instead of an LMS because an LMS is a digital learning environment of sorts, but there are much richer examples of other, other kinds of digital learning environments. And at that point, then the student, teacher, administrator, others will then access that. And, and again, a lot of that happens because it's been associated with this really rich metadata that contextualizes the work. We're seeing then that movement towards the Model C, where we have content repositories and centralized access to information so that um, you're, you're less dependent on the transient sort of nature of some of these digital assets um, and can use them, go back to them, and, uh, and, and use that through some sort of digital learning environment that helps gate the the pedagogical application of those particular resources. So I, I share this model with you because it is um, uh, it is particularly useful about thinking about where you are in that process and where do you want to be um, around the use of digital assets. Back to you, Elizabeth, for the next question. Okay. And that was a lot so, of stuff. It was, it was, but hopefully folks are gleaning something new, maybe from the information you're sharing or reinforcing what they may have already known. So we're going to turn to this question, um, thinking about what evidence folks might see of the LMS trends at your own schools and your own districts. Um, we're going to open up that question. I know there was some comments going back and forth in the parking lot. Michael, I think you addressed the FERPA issue, but I don't know if you want to glance at those as folks are responding to this question. That would be good. We should see that coming I'm up. I'm going to do that. Yep. All right. And before we get going talking about this question, we do have quite a few slides left to go, and we have only about 30 minutes. So. I just want to make sure that we get through everything for folks today. Um, and I trust, Michael, that you can go a little quickly through some of the next slides. I can. <laughs> Better to go quickly than to miss out on something. So we see something here about uh, about used with uh, for intervention. Um, and something that allows, you know, uh, scripts, presumably um, different kinds of environments be able to interact within all systems. Um, and again, that's where some of those standards are absolutely key um, so that uh, it's manageable. Um, historically, there have been APIs for sharing data, and everybody had their own, and um, it was just unmanageable, not just for the, for the creator of the content, but also the consumer of the content. Yeah. Um, somebody brought up the issue that, you know, uh, about every district uh, using a different LMS. Some, you know, some districts get better pricing. Boy, that's just been a perennial problem overall. And I think that, uh, uh, that that's where sort of purchasing consortia and the like can be very, very helpful. Um, I know in Oregon, for example, they have a very nice approach to that. And that's been helpful where they have a lot of very small districts um, to looking at ways they can address that. Um, I, I will be, uh, I, I will respond to people's emails. I know uh, Elizabeth is going to post something about that at the end. Um, but uh, I uh, really am enjoying seeing some of these points and, and even some of the questions that are arising. Yep, that's a great point. We'll have a slide yeah, at the uh, end with Mike. One person here referenced, you know, more higher ed. I think higher ed has a very, very... <laughs> uh, 
somebody um, mentioned universities. I think the the dynamic for a lot of this technology is very different in the university versus K through 12 education. Um, I think universities have more have, certainly have more infrastructure to take you know take standards and really implement them with more localized solutions. Um, where school districts don't even have that kind of infrastructure internally. So I, I would probably say some very different things. Uh, uh, if, we, if we were talking specifically about higher ed. Should we move on? Um, I'm, I am cognizant of the time. Yes, I think that's a good idea. We'll move this along um, and get into talking about the case study. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so um, this is one particular case study. It's not particularly new, but I think it's particularly interesting. And there's been a continued work around this, and you can find a lot of that. I just chose this because I think it was very, very clean. Um, and this was actually some work that my organization did, uh, 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 looking at three different districts that had actually implemented some of this data interoperability. Um, so it's one thing to say it's a good thing. The question is, what are the implications of actually using that? And and I will say right up front, for those of you who are at school districts and are interested in implementing some new technology, collect data about what you're doing before you start doing it. Um, I can't tell you how many places have said, so what do things look like before and after? And nobody had an image before. Um, we don't capture that kind of thing. So think about that now if you're looking about putting an initiative in place. It's compelling when you're, especially when you're going out to the community and asking for funding, and then they want to know what happened. Um, it's far more compelling. You can tell far more uh, compelling stories, and I think even come up with quantitative information that uh, that shows that. And so that was part of the selection of the districts we looked at. Um, uh, so I'm going to quickly go through some of these. And again, the full study is actually available in a link that we have there. We were we looked at three different school districts that were implementing interoperability technologies. In this case, it was around the school's interoperability framework, but I think this would be true for almost any um, implementation. Uh, school in, in Missouri, school in Oklahoma, and another one in Illinois, um, and looked at, uh, and again, very, very different populations of students and uh, somewhat different, certainly in size, from very small to 19,000 is nothing to sneeze at. So, um, And uh, uh, we looked at a variety of different apps that they had actually integrated. In the case of one school district, they were only using two different applications, so they were just trying to get them to talk to one another. Um, in the case of Western Heights, they were gung-ho, and they uh, were using, uh, they actually had 10 different software applications integrated into this interoperability environment, and then Naperville had eight. So uh, again, a variety of different levels of complexity. Um, what they did find uh, is that the benefits of the interoperability is that a single point of data entry results in sort of reduced data entry time and reduced troubleshooting for IT staff. I can also tell you it will also improve the life of the teacher um, because you don't have to, and the parent in particular. Um, for those of you out there who are parents, I don't know about you, I am tired of filling out forms over and over again that ask the same piece of information. So um, that time could be certainly better spent doing a lot of other things. And it just reflects how poorly organized sometimes we are. Um, I would hope, I'd be very curious to know how many of the people um, on, uh, on, this, uh, on this webinar um, are in a school district where they are implementing some sort of data interoperability um, work. I'd be curious just because I think that we're seeing hopefully an upswing in that. Um, and, and that redundancy of data, um, you know, you don't, then you don't have Robert, Roberto, Bob, um, all the same student entered three, four different times in the system, which only just wreaks havoc um, about trying to consolidate any of that. Um, it also then improves, of course, the capabilities to, um, to report data and to analyze data trends, as I've already alluded to, and also looking at uh, staff collaboration, you know, around that consistent process. And I think that's an important thing I want to point out is that um, when it comes to implementing these kinds of systems, the technical side is only half of the, of the effort. Um, and uh, uh, it's really the social relationships that end up being really key. People are used to doing things a certain way. They're used to owning a certain process. And uh, I can't underestimate the importance uh, I, uh, I can't uh, un underemphasize the importance of addressing the social issues 
even as one is is putting the right kind of technical systems in place. Additional benefits really have to do with uh, student achievement, and we'll talk a little bit more about that data. We saw um, uh, in in these cases increases in test scores and also use of predictive analytics um, to really understand sort of how are students learning, what kind of processes are we implementing, and then the ability to be able to determine the impact of those kinds of uh, processes. Also because uh, students, uh, we were able to collect, the school districts were able to collect more data about their student population and consolidate that in a single place. They were actually able to find more federal funding um, and in some cases even state funding around some of the processes because they had a better sense of who was in their school and what those needs actually were, which then in turn improved student services. And uh, uh, it, it's just generally a good thing. I think there's always some concern about do I invest in changing my systems from these disparate different systems to create more of a consolidated approach through this kind of interoperability. Um, uh, we do see that it does pay off. Um, the student increase um, uh, in a, sort of this dis district-wide data um, we, they, they saw um, it rose 35% um, over a period of the three years. The district provided educators with student assessment data to help inform instruction. Um, again, all of this is in detail in the document that you can get. Um, and, and the implementation was the only major district initiative at the time that seemed to affect student performance. And I think that gets back to the point that if it, it, it will only have that impact if you're using the interoperability correctly, just, just being able to share data is not enough. You need to really engage um, classroom teachers, you need to engage the community into a, a, a recognition of how that data is going to be used and how you can apply that. And in this case, um, particularly having a visionary uh, superintendent was particularly important who could really help drive that. So um, teachers and administrators uh, attribute the increase in uh, student achievement to their use of this particular technology, which is which is nice. I'm, I, I'm always a little cautious about that, however. Um, in in Naperville, Naperville, Illinois, um, you know, there's a process of implementing a data warehouse and, and using analytics to better analyze student achievement. Um, they certainly had, a, a, they were trying to capture students who were otherwise getting lost in the system, who, uh, again, when you're looking at a school district of 19,000 students, it's a lot easier to happen than a school district of 3,500. Um, but they really are trying to catch students early in the process where they might be failing or, or, or not doing as well, and then be able to provide an intervention early on. Um, and again, having your finger on that, it, it just can't happen too soon. Um, the, the sooner you can get, you can find those students, the better off you are. So in this case, uh, again, as I mentioned, Western Heights, so increased funding from uh, increasing by $1.3 million over 18 months. Um, and uh, funding for gifted students increasing because they were able to identify students and, and see, find those more easily. And then uh, free and reduced lunch, uh, meals, and then uh, again looking at additional students that had otherwise been lost in the system and how they could actually identify those as part of that process. Um, I really like what Joe Kitchen said. Um, other districts should do it soon. It improves curriculum and instruction. Also brings operational efficiencies to the school district. Um, you can't do things the old way. You must change the way you operate and change for the better. Roll your sleeves and learn a new aspect of your trade. Um, and uh, I think what Joe said is, uh, and he, Joe's a, a pretty traditional kind of guy. I mean, he's pretty outspoken, but I think he really um, put his mouth, uh, you know, put his put his. Uh, money where his mouth was and really said, we're going to make an investment here with an eye to the long term. And he found that the benefit came back a lot sooner. Um, and again, there's a number of different ways to actually do this. So let me turn back to Elizabeth um, for this open-ended question. Sure. So we're talking a little bit about data and how important it is to have the right data to inform decision making. So we're interested in finding out from all of you how you're using data and how you're collecting that data to inform your decision making, whether you be in the classroom or at the school level or the district level. So we're going to put that poll question up. We'll move through it pretty quickly, so um, we'll give you just a few moments to respond there. And um, I'm just checking to see if there's any questions that we haven't gotten to. I know there were some comments as you were talking about the 
collection there's data. There's one question. In trying to yeah. streamline the yeah. information we get from parents. Um, uh, um, so, um, uh, Yeah, there was a, a question um, further up around sort of protecting data privacy and whether that's part of these standards. So um, uh, the, the answer is yes and no. Um, the uh, the uh, data standard for interoperability has the capability um, built within it to, to decide which pieces of data you're going to share. So if you sort of do a select all, then no, it won't protect the student's privacy. But if the district um, says, I only want to share these pieces of data, um, and then the transport architecture that's used, the actual technology used, um, can be as protected as, and I know it's a bad example to nowadays, but credit card information, which all of us seem to put through, um, uh, I mean, it can be encrypted at a variety of different levels. So. Um, uh, the, the standards uh, really do help support a lot of that, but again, how you implement it is absolutely key. Uh, I'm looking at some of these answers around the, the data. Uh, yeah, and so some of these are, are talking about sort of periodic approaches to, um, to use of data. I think that's great. I think also, however, figuring out how do you do something today and get data back quickly and then use that to inform instruction, you know, looking at sort of all different levels of hierarchy around uh, uh, granularity around when you get access to that and how you use it. Um, and this one about reteaching a skill, probably within an LMS um, in terms of that level of granularity. But again, it would be nice if it consolidated that across multiple resources that are being used. <clears throat> uh, using it with blended learning. Um, yeah. Um, and I think also our schools of education are getting a little bit better about using sort of, uh, it, it, and it really varies depending on where, you, um, where you've been educated as to uh, whether you're getting a good, a good foundation in the use of data to inform instruction. Um, there needs to be a way uh, uh, to make sure that we're being cons more consistent that way across, across the country. Um, these are great. I'm really, I really enjoy seeing um, a lot of these responses. I know a lot of you must be enjoy seeing that as well. Should we move on? Uh, I'll, I'll get into some of the, the technology and special needs, and, and then wind up with some of the uh, action items. Sounds great. So. There are a whole myriad of different ways to address the needs of all students, um, and I, I'm not going to try to uh, address those. I'm really only going to touch on, on really two aspects. Um, I do uh, uh, a fair bit of work with Benetech, if they're a group that you're familiar with, um, also, uh, uh, and 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 the kind of work that they're actually doing on the West Coast um, uh, for uh, working with the Department of Ed and others around accessibility of content. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, when it comes to technology for English language learners, and I saw this was a question that somebody had actually posed when they signed up, um, we're, we're actually, I, I can't say much about this, but we're actually working on a study um, right now looking at technology for English language learners and trying to find ways to, uh, to identify those, um, and it's part of a two-year study that just started back in September. So for those of you who are interested in ELL, look for that. Um, I, I am uh, hell-bent to make sure that it is as applicable to classroom practice as possible, but also it informs, um, uh, you know, sort of administrative decisions, et cetera. So that will be coming. But, um, you know, st students come to school with different backgrounds and with different experiences, and I think that's key. Um, not just around English language learners, but also just the context that students bring. But I think we see technologies really helping to build student vocabulary um, and and uh, reviewing content-specific words with students in terms of trying to build that. And that may be one of those sort of lower-level drill-and-kill kinds of practice pieces. But I think there's a, great to, there's a way to gamify that. There's a way to engage students so that they have that working vocabulary. Um, also modeling um, for students, really having them read good, well-written. How is that to say? If I said read good written, 
that would be bad. Um, reading well-written materials, um, and because they don't often get exposure to that, um, and uh, uh, really getting a chance to have that model for them as part of that process, um, and then having students working in pairs and in part of group work, not just alone, but using the technology in a way that helps uh, that helps uh, pull together different groups of students so that they can uh, depend on each other and work with each other around those particular pieces. Um, again, make you really need to make sure that the technology is sort of goal aligned and meaningful. Um, I have been in classrooms where there have been good software misused. I've also seen bad software used well, depending on how it's applied. So simply reviewing the 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 application itself, the the digital learning resource is insufficient. You really have to look at how it's being applied. Um, where I've found some of the most compelling pieces, and I taught in Southeast San Jose, um, was really finding, uh, and even in my present town where I am in Bellingham, Washington, um, really connecting families with technical resources that support student learning um, often address families where even the parent isn't an English speaker, um, but really integrates them and makes them feel more welcome into the school environment um, and provides them with that kind of support. So the technology can play an incredibly important role there. Having software that can be bilingual, that can read out particular words, um, that there are particular strategies that are actually employed, getting a thesaurus and a definition, et cetera, all functionality that if used correctly can help support English language learners. Um, uh, students with disabilities, um, you know, know the students' needs um, and what kind of resources are available, use the appropriate technology. Um, where it's available, if it isn't, be aware of what technology is available. There often are other sources of funding to get those technologies and then use the technology to engage students in sort of meaningful tasks. I think there's a tendency, particularly when you're working with students with learning disabilities, to, to think that giving them access means dumbing down something. Um, and I think the technology in particular can get you away from that. I mean, uh, students who may uh, be advanced cognitively and may have other kinds of disabilities um, can engage in really thoughtful, meaningful ways. Um, and I think even students who have cognitive disabilities um, often are able to use that to their advantage and in, their, in ways that are unique to them. And I think the technology will provide some of those kinds of access um, and, uh, and, and really address kind of some of their needs. Um, in terms of uh, formats, you know, making instructional materials to all learners, available to all learners is absolutely essential. And that is not a simple process. Um, uh, publishers in general have been reluctant to release digital versions of their uh, text materials. Um, I think that they are a little bit more enlightened now. Um, and uh, uh, Benetech has, an, has a, uh, an initiative called Bookshare. Um, I hope that many of you are aware of Bookshare. And uh, in some cases, they get those files from a publisher. In other cases, they scan them. And then uh, they can make those available sort of in digital text readers and via Braille. Um, they could be simply larger size, uh, different color, greater contrast. There are ways that we can provide access to those materials. And, and uh, it is very hard to do that without the technology. And I think the technology plays an important role there. Part of what um, I co-chair is a group within Benetech called Born Accessible. Um, and the goal there is not to have to go through and reprint or get digital files, but make sure that as new materials are being created that they are in a readable form by these kinds of technologies. Um, there is, I don't know, you, one of you can come up with an example where this is not true, but virtually every, even if it's print and delivered on paper, it is digital in its earlier form. I don't think many people are producing sort of general typeset materials anymore. So it starts digital already. The question is, you as educators need to put pressure um, on publishers to make sure that they understand the benefit that comes from students having access. And by the way, it's not just a good idea. It's the law um, in terms of providing access. Um, what's important is that you as educators are, are really pushing to have that kind of access. The other one is something called Diagram Center. Um, we know a, uh, a we, we commonly say that a, a picture is worth a thousand words, but it has more compound issues than students who can't necessarily read the words on the page, and that is that seeing an image is particularly problematic. So the example I have here is from science. This is the, uh, the, the water cycle. I mean, this is a complex diagram. And if you just read the text in there, even if you use a text reader for this, you don't actually get that. So um, there's, and I know this is small, I apologize for that, but I wanted to get all the different 
um, aspects on here. There's actually an initiative called um, uh, Diagram Center that is, uh, again, funded through the federal government, but work that's being done at Benetech. And they do accept volunteers, if any of you are interested. And you just simply go through books and you describe um, in, a, in, a, in a somewhat consistent fashion, you describe images that students who are either um, have, have visual disabilities or, or, or are blind can actually engage with that content um, within that piece. This would not happen without the technology. There's just no way to do that. And you need to, you really should recognize it's out there. The school districts uh, are, they are supposed to always be able to provide this. And I think you can turn to the publishers and tell them how important it is. Um, to have access to materials in these kinds of formats. So let's go to the, 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 the question quickly here, Elizabeth. Well, I was going to suggest that we move right through this. I want to make sure you get a chance for that last section, and we'll open up one last question for folks before we finish at 3 o'clock, or at 5 o'clock. Perfect. I can do that. So, um, in terms of action steps, what are, what are the, sort of the outcomes from this? Um, uh, uh, <laughs> let's see how many of you expected this slide to come up. Um, if you look at the top image, there's some motor homes, um, and the bottom one, there are mobile homes. Um, one would think there wouldn't be much difference, and yet there's a huge difference. And I think so often um, we have uh, school districts that that are that start as motor homes and turn into mobile homes which is, um, you know, they even take the chassis off of them. So they're not even mobile anymore. Um, um, creating a climate that is, uh, that is open to change, that is, that is really accept, accepts that. There's, it, there's no, it's not like there's no design or sense making in that top image of the motorhome. It just means that if somebody wants to go someplace else or, or you want to make effect a change, you can actually do that far more easily. So um, hopefully this will leave, leave a lasting image in your heads. Um, when we look at technology infrastructure, I think it's important, and this is why I decided to focus on this, the back-end technology today is really as important as the instructional technology. Um, simply providing the technology on the front end, um, you're only realizing a small bit of the benefit that can come from using these kinds of technologies. Um, uh, really important that you request access to the information needed to inform your teaching. Um, request that instructional assets are in formats that are accessible, um, and then also educating parents and administrators about how you use that data. There are a lot of misconceptions out there, particularly at the community level, and uh, you know, politicians, school boards respond to what communities are asking for. So make sure that um, communities are aware of the benefits that come from the technology and how it can be applied, and help make sure they know you're not using just technology for gratuitous purposes. You're not using it every place. You're using it where it makes the biggest difference. Um, ask yourselves, where does this technology actually fit? And this diagram, again, is really useful. Are you using technology in each one of these places where it can be helpful in helping link the pieces together? Are, um, are you purposely excluding something? And if you're doing so thoughtfully and you think there's no reason to do that, that's fine. But, um, but make sure it's purposeful and not just because you forgot to do it. Um, action steps for teachers, again, use the technology purposefully. Um, use the resources you have access to effectively. Create these kind of learning environments, learning, learning, um, uh, personal, uh, professional learning communities, um, whether that's through your district or informally. Um, you know, explicitly explain to students the use of the technology. Don't just throw it at them. Help them be more, uh, more intelligent consumers. Um, create an environment that supports and encourages the use of technology, and then also use the nets. They're, it's really very, very useful for principals. You can see um, supporting teachers, modeling use of technology, um, encourage the technology, include that as sort of regular observation, um, and make recommendations and have discussions around that, um, and then provide technical support for the school, particularly where you have new adopters, um, and again, engage everybody in that process, and again, NETS. Um, and for district leaders, create a real vision around the technology and make sure everybody has a uh, ability to have input and buy-in into that um, and ensure they have adequate access to the different technologies and enough internet uh, bandwidth to be able to use those technologies. Um, evaluate schools based on the technologies they have and then also, of course, use NETS. Um, teacher prep programs, you can see some of this there. We're running short on time. Um, but again, I, technology needs to be an essential part of that. And you'll get these slides as well. So. Um, 
uh, model technology used for schools is probably one of the most important pieces there, um, and uh, model good technology use. Um, and then in, generally, you know, technology in education is like a gym membership. Um, just having it doesn't make you any better. Um, you have to actually go and do something. Tailoring the technology used to your needs and students' needs is absolutely essential. So um, look at the whole environment. Look at a systemic solution and change. The technology won't do it for you, but it's an important part of, of the end result. Michael, thank you for getting through those pieces so quickly. Um, hopefully folks were thinking along those lines and, and um, considering some of those ideas for their own purposes and taking away to their schools and districts and states. But we are going to open up one last poll to hear from you all. What, did, what is your key takeaway from today's presentation? And what action do you intend to take? Uh, we'll put that up. And we'll make sure that if there, is any lingering, there are any lingering questions, we can get to those. While folks are typing, I'll just mention that this is the last in our series for this year, for 2015. We'll be back in the early spring, and we'll have a new set of uh, webinars and webinar topics for you for 2016. We do take your feedback into consideration, and so use today's evaluation to note any topics that you feel would be useful to hear about. Do also look at our archives. This is the third year of the series, so we have covered a lot of topics already. And you might find, if you haven't been a regular attender, or um, even if you haven't, you might have missed one of our events, there are a lot of topics that we've already covered. And there's some great resources on the RHEL Mid-Atlantic site that you can download and share with colleagues and use um, for your professional purposes. So <clears throat> you'll see a slide in a moment with some of those links. But let's turn and look at these takeaways, Michael. Um, let's see what wonderful things folks learned from you today. Yeah, it looked like some people really um, thought that some of those statements at the end will be helpful with the technology, their technology planning groups. Um, The interoperability diagram, I thought I'm that one was really helpful. About I love how specific technology that is. And, uh, uh, some discussion about LMS and, and use of LMS. It's certainly only the tip of the iceberg. For all of you out there, I could have gone on about this topic for several days, probably. <laughs> And again, happy to, to direct any of you to resources that you might use if you have particular questions. Oh, nice. The Great. one about, so, not, about hiring a tech person is not necessarily the answer to incorporating more technology. Um, we'll just leave this up for about 30 seconds more. Um, great to see that folks are taking away a lot of good information. Um, we, that is our goal, and we hope that you can make some changes to your own practice as a result of what you heard today. I'll take this opportunity to thank you, Michael, for your time and preparing today's presentation and being here to share all of this great information with our audience. Um, and I know folks will join me in giving you a virtual round of applause for um, the wonderful presentation today. Thanks. And then I'm going to move those polls off. Um, I know some folks are still typing. I want to make sure people can see Michael's contact information coming up here. As you can see, Michael at 
justicedemics.com. If you have general questions about the RHEL Mid-Atlantic or the series, you can get in touch with me or our general webinar at RHEL Mid-Atlantic email address. You can follow us on Twitter or Facebook. Um, if, since you are on our list, you've attended one of our events, you will receive emails about the upcoming events, but do look out for the next in the series early in the spring. And um, we will certainly take your feedback into consideration, so I'm going to get you to that evaluation right now, and we hope you'll take a few minutes to answer some questions for us. And we hope you all have a great evening. Thank you for being here. And thanks again, Michael. Thank you.